Hello everyone, my name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to the channel. And today we are continuing our interview series, but not with Kinkfest. We are actually doing a couple of interviews that are just sort of not related to Kinkfest, just for fun. And specifically today, we're actually going to be speaking with Peter Tupper, who is the author of one of our most recent books for our monthly BDSM book club, which is A Lover's Pinch, A Cultural History of Sadomasochism. So today we're going to be talking about that book and more details about BDSM history, because I know, at least for me, after I read that book, I definitely still had some questions and some more thoughts that I was hoping to be able to explore. But for those people who maybe haven't read the book yet or aren't familiar with you, uh, would you mind maybe giving a little bit of an introduction about who you are and what your background in BDSM is? Hello, Evie. Yeah, well, my name is Peter Tupper. I've been involved in the kink world for uh, at least 20 years, probably longer. And uh, I'm also uh, studied history. And uh, I actually got into kink around the same time as I was getting my history degree. As I looked into the history of kink, um, the more I realized that there wasn't really a history of kink. People would sort of make these little anecdotes or little glimpses of historical figures, but there wasn't like a coherent story of, of kink in, in human history. Like uh, in your talk last week, uh, somebody called it them snapshots and another person called it a folk history. And I think those are both accurate. And uh, that those, those are a bit frustrating if you want something a bit more rigorous. So a few years after I'd been involved in the Vancouver kink scene, Vancouver, BC, I started thinking about writing a nonfiction book. Toni Morrison once said that you should write the book you would love to read. So I started blogging about the history of my research into history of BDSM as I went, and that became uh, the, the notes that became um, A Lover's Pinch, uh, which was just published last summer. Easily 12 years of work gone into that, and I'm hopefully that this can be, this can really spark some greater understanding of kink history, and I think there really isn't another book like it in the world. Yeah, and, and that really actually covers some of the questions I wanted to ask you, which is sort of what inspired you to write the book and then what was the process like I didn't realize how much work had gone into it that it was literally 12 years it makes it sound like there wasn't really a lot of easily available <laughs> information on JSTOR or other academic websites kind of going into this no not really there were I mean it would have this would have been very difficult to do before like you know Google and modern internet searches and things like this but it was uh, it was very, it was pretty difficult because I was kind of like you know, I go through a, a, a academic book and try to find this like one little snippet of information that could tie into the kink story. Or so it was difficult to go through, and and um, it's not really, it's not really. An, I believe as, you, as some of your uh, commenters mentioned last week, this isn't really an academic discipline, at least not yet. It's not like there's a there are dedicated bibliographies for this topic. And I was sort of having to sort of grope around. Like the analogy I used is that it's like, it's like if, if you know, different fields of histories are buildings in a city that are sort of laid out on a nice neat grid. To, to explore the history of SM, you have to like find these like hidden passages and sort of crawl through the vents for, and from one place to another. Yeah, so it's like you have to, find locations that are that and piece together something that that hasn't been seen as a coherent thing before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not like anybody's sort of looking at this forward thinkingly like, oh, maybe we should write this down because somebody in the future will want to be able to write a book about this. Yeah, exactly. So much of it is just like so much material has been destroyed over the years. Like you were talking about uh, the Arthur Munby Hannah Colwick relationship last week. Munby seriously considered destroying all of his papers when he was close to death. And we, you know, if that had happened, we never would have known they had that he and Hannah Colwick had this special relationship. It would have been completely lost to history. And that's, you know, and that's happened before. Like, who knows how many other people's personal histories of kink have just never been written down or had the materials destroyed because people, their, you know, well-meaning relatives thought they were, weren't worth preserving. 
Yeah, or were even a little bit of a family shame, I imagine, to have had that rumor, especially in that time period where, you know, everybody's relatively close knit and your your social reputation especially counts for a lot and it can haunt your family for a long time. So so yeah, then that, that story in particular I think was really valuable because I, I can't imagine how you would be able to connect the dots, you know, because we kind of start out talking about for people who haven't read the book, talking about uh, you know, early Christianity and Catholicism and then Protestantism and then Puritans and then slowly you're kind of working your way through up until modern history. And I really think it is uh, in particular uh, the story of, of, of Hannah Colwick that connects the bridge between sort of the, the the old and the new, I guess you could say, or at least that's sort of how I perceived it is like now we've kind of fully made the transition from something that's maybe kind of more religious based into something that's kind of evolving into personal relationships that maybe don't really have any religious connotation to them or, or, or literature or something like, you know, Marquis de Sade or something like that. I think that there is, there is something, there is a sort of subtle transition in how it starts out in religion and certain ways of experience that were once part of a religion have been pushed out of it and they've ended up in belief in the in service and in, in masochism and things like that and it's like there's even a, a segment where Munby explicitly compares Hannah Colwick to uh, religious women of old like women who are saints or martyrs and uh, likens them her to them so and you know and if you look around a lot of people invest a, a spiritual dimension into kink not all of them but a lot of them so i find it very interesting that that uh uh the, the crossover of the two even though some not everybody invests any any sort of spiritual significance in, in their sexuality that also kind of reminds me of something that i thought about while reading the book but i don't think i i brought it up any other point and that would be it seems like we sort of start a lot of our, our history or over in the, the so-called old world, like over in Europe and in particular in, in England. And then eventually, like all the modern history kind of evolves out of America. And I'm wondering, yeah. in your research, were you able to find anything about the evolution of kink in, in say, Canada or in the UK specifically? Or does it seem like it's maybe more starts in the UK, all the Puritans go to America, <laughs> that yeah. kind of sows the seeds of eventually, uh, you know, through culture and history and time just kind of ends up becoming the BDSM community. Uh, is the, Or is it more that like maybe it starts in one area and then just through transference of culture, people moving, introducing ideas of the internet, it's in its modern form spreads to other places? Well, from what I understand, uh, in America, until about the, until the uh, Civil War era, uh, there's very little domestically produced pornography, or at least as we would, we would recognize it as such. It's after that, and what there was tended to be imported from Europe. And afterwards is when you started seeing sort of domestically produced um, stuff in, 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 in the United States. Part of that is maybe due to like the, and a lot, although there is still a lot of material being pirated from uh, the UK and other worlds. And there was this sort of like, you know, transnational and, and, and an even uh, cross Atlantic trade in uh, pornographic works being sort of smuggled and passed over from uh, a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy. So there wasn't, you know, the, the idea that there's sort of this mass production sort of was a relatively recent thing. I think what happened is that in starting in the post-war America, you had uh, you sort of said the emergence of like a specialized publishing field of fetishistic porn, which is this is when you had John Willie publishing Bazaar magazine, and uh, you had the Claw, uh, Irving and Paula Claw running Movie Star News and branching out into selling artwork and photography and the film loops. That was when you had Betty Page modeling and things like that. So that was when you had like a sort of a, a subset of the adult industry uh, working. And it was sort of the sort of niche thing, like like John Willie, he was basically selling copies of Bazaar out of the trunk of his car 
And what happened over the 60s in America, you know, this became larger, uh, it became more specialized, uh, diversified in terms of content. So you started seeing like transvestite fiction, you started seeing uh, more diversity in terms of the type of kink play. You saw artists like um, Eric Stanton and Gene Bilbrew and, guy, and uh, guys like that who were, you know, major contributors to the style. Uh, this is also when censorship eased up a lot and uh, also when like porn became sort of more a more consolidated industry and fetish porn, which used to be sort of the semi-amateur field, became sort of assimilated into that industry as sort of a market niche within it and not the sort of independent thing. So you, that's, you started seeing a lot of production in America. I'm honestly not haven't really looked into what was going on in you know, into Britain or other uh, Western countries at the time. So there, I don't know if there was some this kind of material being produced at the same time, or, or whether it was because they had. It depends a lot on like the, how how the authorities viewed um, publishing adult material and censorship and things like that. Specifically about Canada, uh, there was a rather peculiar newspaper called Justice Weekly, which was published in, the, in Canada, was em emphasized a lot of uh, domestic discipline type spanking letters. But uh, I don't know if, I'm not actually sure there was much in the way of production in Canada other than that. So there was a, so, but it's like definitely there was a lot that was what we know, have a good historical record on. Uh, what was going on in America. I have, like I said, I haven't had the chance to look into what was going on in Britain at the time. Yeah, I'd be really curious. I mean, obviously, I'm sure there would be another decade of work right there just trying to uncover that information. But I, I'd be really curious to know what that is. And in particular with the with things like Bizarre and Exotic Magazine and so on, um, I, I don't believe you specifically mentioned this, but I would be curious to know if maybe they were connected to, to sort of the long running chain of like pulp fiction that was going between like, you know, the late 1800s to, you know, pretty much mid World War II ish, because those covers especially had a lot of <laughs> very, what we would consider today to be pretty risque or provocative or definitely a lot of BDSM elements to them, like women being chased by monsters and tied down to tables and oh my god this poor innocent woman's about to be tortured by this horrible thing and that was like the main selling point for a lot of people who who produced those novels and it seems like in some ways uh, when things like exotic and and bizarre magazine started to get produced that it was less it it, it was kind of calling it what it was as opposed to trying to pass it off as sort of like uh, like i don't know sure how to phrase this but like there's the idea of just having something hot to like sell a magazine and the content within it is maybe not as directly provocative versus just like what you see is what you get on the cover and the whole thing through is really directly fetish related as opposed to just a marketing tool more or less. Well, that's, yeah, that's a good point because like uh, Weird Tales published a lot of H.P. Lovecraft and Robert E. Howard. Um, they were notorious for uh, the cover, uh, the, co the pastel covers by uh, Margaret Brundage. And they had a lot of like, you know, Orientalist type women in silks and being chained up and things like that. And, and uh, that was definitely part of the, the newsstand appeal to those magazines. I don't know what Robert E. Howard, I don't know what uh, Lovecraft thought about the covers of the magazines that published his work, but that's another story. But so there was definitely like, you can find that like, well, it's interesting because like also in the fifties and sixties, you had those men's adventure magazines, the women in peril, like being threatened by Nazis and communists and things like that. So there, even that when there was the fetish magazines being published under the, uh, as a semi underground, you had these mainstream magazines that were doing this kind of imagery as well. Uh, although they were ostensibly, you know, general interest magazines. And I think that you even, uh, yeah, so you can always find, like there's always, uh, it's it's hard not to, there's always a temptation to put a woman in peril on the cover of something, whether it's a magazine or a book or a newspaper or a, or a, film, a film poster to get attention.
whether or not that's that sort of matches with the content. But you can definitely see that in the post-war and the pre-war era. Even in the pre-war era, there were magazines like London Life, for example, which did fetish letters involving spanking and flagellation, forced cross-dressing and, and uh, amputee fetishism and women wrestling and stuff like that, you know, published for decades before. So you can trace those back well into the 19th century. There was this little niche of these, mag of these uh, fetish letter magazines. Although they are published in England, not in America. Yeah, yeah. And, and from what I understand, England didn't really have the same sort of pulp fiction culture that America did. Like they didn't have things like Weird Tales or Black Mask or, or, or those sorts of things. Yeah, I'm not sure if they were publishing that kind of material back then. I know that like they ha I think they had their own sort of pulp tradition, although they might have had stricter um, controls over what they would put on the cover. Yeah, and that's always like something I'm really curious about is I wonder like was the market there for it and it was just there was a restriction on what was able to be published that kind of prevented people from making the art that was maybe more directly fetish related or sex or, or like more explicitly sexual or was it just maybe people weren't like kind of culturally ready yet let's say to to put that out there and actually sell it there definitely was a lot of I guess we're talking about the difference between what you might call mainstream newsstand depictions of kink and sort of underground stuff. I think, and that, again, that depends on how the, the culture of, of print media was distributed and what kind of censorship was in the works. Um, and I think those were probably different in America from the UK. So that might have had, you know, Peter Bowen might have been more relaxed on, on one side of the, of the Atlantic than the other. But I think there definitely was both in America and in England and in France as well. There were adult novels, adult magazines, you know, circulating sometimes sort of above the counter, sometimes below. I, I kind of want to go back in time a little bit and just cover a couple of things that we did bring up during our discussion when we were reviewing the book. And that would be kind of the, the old BDSM history myths and if you were able to find anything that substantiated them a lot because a lot of people go back to like Greek and Roman times to point to BDSM activities and kind of their origins but from what I remember you did not explicitly mention anything Greco-Roman uh, as like a, a source of any sort of BDSM practice so I think the big one that people usually bring up is certain Greek philosophers that enjoyed being ridden as a horse by his lover <laughs> and whether or not that was the start of pony play. This is this kind of illustrates uh, uh, something you have to be careful about in historical in historical research because you mentioned like certain Greek stories but you see the the mounted Aristotle story doesn't appear the earliest known appearance of that is I believe 14th century so it came long after that you can find it in medieval manuscripts here and there both written and illustrated so I think it's important to, so it's probably a anecdote that originated long, long after, I mean, Aristotle was a real person, Alexander the Great was a real person, but you know, the, the, there's the earliest mention of the mounted Aristotle story, the idea that the courtesan Phyllis tricks him into letting her ride him like a horse, that happened, that doesn't appear until like centuries later. So sometimes these things that crop up are basically like almost like little jokes that circulate around and don't may or may not have anything, any sort of historical basis. So it, and the Phyllis story is really is kind of a mixed bet as a mixed question, too, because it sort of makes light of and confirms the idea that women can trick men, even the smartest men into being fools through their beauty. So it sort of proves the, the it, it confirms its own point, even as, if it is sort of told as a joke. And so we have to be careful when we look at things like that. And, and just because it was said about, you know, ancient Greece, we don't, we don't necessarily know for certain that it was. This is, and the other problem is, is that when we look at like Greek and Roman sexuality, you're dealing with a sexual culture that is very, very different from our definitions of what sex is, what sex is for. To a Greek or Roman person, 
the idea of a distinction between gay and straight wouldn't really make any sense. It would be a meaningless distinction. You know, there, the, a Greek citizen, you know, might have absolutely no objections, might not care about whether they, he was penetrating a woman or a man, but he'd never allow a man to penetrate him. So when we look at, like, for example, in Pompeii, and I cite, for example, like, Pom when they were digging up Pompeii, they were discovering all of these, this phallic and vaginal art. And these people were, the, the prim early scholars and religious people who were looking at digging this up were sort of so baffled by this that they assumed that, like, most of the houses in in Pompeii were actually brothels. No. Oh. And it turns out that no, it's just that's something the explicitly sexual art is just something the Romans like to have around. They just thought it was it was a sign of it was a sign of health and vitality and fertility. They wouldn't draw a meaningful distinction between pornographic depictions of nude humans and non pornographic distinctions. It just wouldn't be a meaningful difference to them. So I'm very careful about looking at Greek and Roman sources for this. Like we, if like, again, going back to Pompeii, there's a house called the Villa of the Mysteries, which includes a fresco that runs around the inside that shows what is generally interpreted as the marriage rites of a young woman in the cult of Dionysus. And one of this, one part of the sequence shows her being flogged or caned by a woman, another woman, and the, as part of this marriage uh, preparation. So it's like, we, we're, we're sort of like looking at this and we have to be careful not to jump to conclusions and say, aha, it's sadomasochism. But we have to sort of be careful and say, well, maybe, but it's also like tied up in religious rights and um, a different view of humanity and sexuality than we have now. So you have to, I'm very careful about, about saying, ah, the ancient Greeks did sadomasochism too. And so I'm trying to say that there's things, they did things that resemble it, but I, I'm cautious about saying that it is sadomasochism. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that's historically responsible, although obviously not everybody, I think, approaches it that way which is why in the bdsm community like people just kind of spout off these little stories that they've heard from somebody who's heard from somebody who told them and it, it gets repeated and it becomes kind of incorporated into the mythos of what bdsm people believe about themselves and like i think it, it is comforting kind of in a way to maybe believe that like oh our our behavior has origins that are, are thousands of years old so it's not like it's a modern deviance that's been created by like the the evils of modern living versus like how people were in the like pure and respectable days of old um which i think is maybe why a lot of people do it yeah people want to come up with this fantastic liter uh past like whether they're you know these famous these supposed European and training houses or things like that or you know that and I think that that's uh that's an important I'm one of the, I'm hoping that this book will sort of uh get some real solid information out there and and not have people investing so much effort into these weird little stories who knows how they get started so I'm hoping that yeah so you know I've never found any evidence of European training houses and things like that yeah, and I, I don't know how how much do you do you know about that particular story that gets passed around because it's one of those things that I've I've vaguely heard of like if you read something online like if you Google like what is old guard like it'll get briefly mentioned but I'm not actually sure is there anything that kind of goes deeper about like what these training houses were supposedly doing or like where they were or is it just there were training houses they existed. Yeah. I think they probably, a lot of it can probably be traced back to Story of O and, you know, the Chateau of Rossi where they, she was taken. So I, that, that's probably a major contributor to that particular myth. It's an important, there is an important distinction between that and uh, the old guard. Uh, like you talked about last time, you know, there were the sort of first generation of leathermen, of gay leathermen in like the, 
40s and 50s, and they were, they were a real thing. It's just that there was, you know, a lot of exaggeration and mythology and the one true wayism that I don't think does anybody any good. I think that there's a perpetual, there's a perpetual crisis of authenticity in the kink world. There's a, always this feeling of that, you know, new people are constantly coming in and you all people who are already there have this constant insecurity about that and they want to refer to some proper way to do it that is you know that the you know this jealously hoarded knowledge that they have and and the newcomers don't so um i would i hope that's another myth that i'm hoping to bust and get people to have a better understanding of what's going on like you know, just the other day, I, uh, I I met a person whose first exposure to kink was the Fifty Shades of Grey movies. And, you know, that's it. I knew that was coming. I could have seen it a mile away. And it's like, well, here she is. And we have, to, but she's, she's here in the scene. And I don't, she doesn't need me to give her a bad attitude. You know, I'm just trying to be, you know, she, I'm just trying to get her give her some good information and hopefully get, let her understand. And if she wants then but let her find her own way. And these things, these things do change. Like, you know, there's the, I've, I've been in the scene long enough to see uh, the, the texture and the, uh, of the scene change very much. Like, you know, the, the coming of things like fat life uh, as a major change. I've seen, you know, rope, for example, has become extremely popular the last few years, so much so that there's kind of at the party I go to regularly, there's like a a sort of sort of corner of the dungeon that's basically just solely for rope, and the people who go there kind of stay there and they don't really mix with anybody else. And like, you know, that's that's them. Let them let them do what they want to do and don't be a pig and don't be a prick about it to them. You know, if you've been around long enough, you'll see newcomers come and don't, you don't need to be a jerk to that, to the new people. If they want to learn, they'll learn and you need and be there to teach them. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there is this temptation, like you mentioned earlier, with like the need for authenticity and the need for authority behind what you do. And I, I, I can see why it would be tempting as somebody, maybe you don't even really have that much experience in the scene, maybe you've only been in for a year or two, but the idea that you even know a little bit about the history more than somebody else is kind of like, oh, well, like, I know more than you do, and, like, kind of a little bit of looking down the nose at another person because, you know, they're potentially ignorant of, like, some giant secret that you have about, like, the origins of, of BDSM, and I think, like, just... With many things, it's really just better to like be open and be kind to others, and like assume that they're there because they want to learn and and know so much. And uh, I know I've been asked a million and one times about my opinion on Fifty Shades of Grey and and other movies of of that variety, and like I don't really necessarily know how helpful it is to just be like angry that people like have discovered BDSM through like uh, modern media because that's inevitable and being frustrated with it doesn't really change the fact that that you know there's people who want to come and learn the right way to do it so like let's let's bring them into the fold let's help them learn what they want to learn you know we were all every single one of us was a clueless noob once to be nice yeah you weren't you weren't born and raised in an old guard uh <laughs> training like training villa you know beneath the castle like you know just not a thing not a thing that happened uh and as well i think it can even be kind of like a dangerous idea in some ways because you know if you have person a over here who has this sort of misinformed idea about history and about old guard and they kind of use it to posture with new people. The new people kind of get sort of the, and, and unless they happen to have already maybe read your book before they, you know, come into the community, uh, you know, they're going to be like, wow, that's really cool and amazing. And then they're just going to take whatever that person says as, as word and kind of pass on this misinformation. And I think sometimes it can, you know, it's great to, to form self-identity, but when it's used to kind of 
bully others in some ways or like kind of act as a stand in for like, here's my authority. Here's how, you know, I'm an expert on the subject that can be dangerous territory. Yeah. Um, we don't, the last thing we need is more one true wayism. Somewhat kind of related, but one of the things I wanted to ask about is the development of, of BDSM as a term specifically, because from my understanding, it was originally referred to primarily as s &M, and then there were people who did bondage and discipline kind of separately from that. Is there any, any tr truth to that or like kind of, wh wh how did these things end up coming together? <laughs> You'd hear a lot of different things. You'd hear things like SM or S slash M or S. Uh, you hear things like Sadie Max or Sadie May. I understand Leatherman used to call it the work. That's awesome. I feel like we should use that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, BDSM, I believe, started around in the, in the, I should really know this better, but I think it like started on, on alt.sex.bondage on Usenet in the 90s. And I think it's a it's it's a it's a good enough it's it's a good enough term. Like I, I mean, I'm sure you've seen like what used to be LGBT became LGBTQ, and and now we're stuck with like now and there people are like tacking on more and more letters, and it it's trying to trying to stick all this stuff together it gets really unwieldy. So to me, BDSM is a is a good enough uh, acronym. It covers, um, you know, covers a lot. It doesn't necessarily necessarily cover fetishistic forms of sexuality, um, but it's I don't know. I, I I've yet to come up with a better uh, a better four letter acronym for it. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, I think there is kind of this problem where it's like you know how much can we really fit into it because even within those four letters there's like okay there's bondage and and discipline and sadism and masochism and like there's just so there's so much even layered within just those different combinations of potential activities that it, it kind of is i think if we try to add anything else onto it i'm not even sure what it would be yeah and it's and it like people are, there's a lot of questions about what is and isn't BDSM and what is and isn't kink. And, you know, there is a lot of like, you know, there are, I've met people who are into sort of the, the body piercing and, and suspension type activities, like suspending from hooks in the bodies and things like that, who don't consider what they're doing to be SM at all. And so I think like, and, you know, that's, I'm sure there we could debate that you know, all night and not come to any conclusion. There are, you know, it, it's, it's like I said, it's good enough. It'll do for now, but it's, it, and it covers a lot of stuff and it, I believe, but I also believe that there is a, a, a culture there with the history. And I think that the people should be more aware of that. I think people should have a stronger sense of a, a kink identity and, and uh, that that uh, reaches across boundaries like, you know, even gay straight divide or, or um, cis trans divides. Like, I think in the BDSM community, there's there's kind of this separation between straight spaces, gay spaces, specifically with with gay men and then between lesbian women and then also just queer folks in general. And it's it's interesting to me because it seems like you know, reading through the history in, in the 90s, obviously it sort of, it starts out over here and it's it's like a lot of the origin history is around gay male clubs. And, but it seems like in a lot of ways, at least at the beginning that a straight and queer woman and gay man, it was very, it was all a lot more interconnected than I think maybe we might perceive it to be because I, before I read the book, just sort of believed that, okay, the gay men were first, and then there were the gay women, and then eventually the straights kind of adopted it, and then we have the, the current BDSM world, but it seems like that, at least based on the research that, that you've done for the book, that that's really not kind of how things went, at least yeah. in America. It was more of a, more like sort of three parallel cultures. 
uh, evolving side by side, but with a certain degree of cross cross fertilization. So, like when when um, the Oil and Spiegel Society and the Society of Janus, which were these the first sort of above ground open admission groups, were evolving in New York and in San Francisco. That part of their mandates were education, and the people who knew the most about SM play were gay leathermen and pro doms. So they had to that they had to draw on them as experts, and they had to find places where it was okay for them to do this. And where did they go? But you know, professional dungeons and uh, leather bars and clubs. They were helping, and it wasn't like succeeding generations. It was like it was sort of parallel tracks. Kinky lesbians, they were sort of evolving in their own realm in the 70s onward, and they were borrowing elements of gay leather culture and heterosexual kink culture, and but also developing their own things. I've heard, don't quote me on this, that, for example, erotic cutting was primarily a lesbian intervention. But, you know, that's, I haven't, I don't have good sourcing for that, but I've, I think that they did develop their own ideas. And I think things have gotten a little, that things actually got a little more separate, especially HIV. That was a, the coming of HIV in the early 80s was a big impact and I think had a huge impact on, on the gay leather culture and sort of made it separate from uh, hetero leather culture hetero BDSM culture at the same time. But I also think is that that sort of, uh, it was never completely separate. And I also think that, um, you know, like for instance, Safe Dane and Consensual, that was conceived by a gay man for a gay organization, David Stein, uh, RIP. And he was, and that's been adopted, that was adopted by other lesbians and straight people, adopted by, and, and uh, you know, and I think that ne the there's a the new generation is very sort of much more fluid about uh, gender identity and sexual identity, and I think there's a lot of good overlap between the two. There's no longer quite so rigid a divide between gay and straight and gay and lesbian kink practices, which I, is for the best in my opinion. Yeah, I I would agree with that as well. Obviously, I'm sure everybody has has their own opinions about it but i think having as fellow kinky people having cultural unity is probably for the better you know rather than to to the detriment i would i would think um something that i thought was really interesting that you mentioned in the book specifically when it came to like the history and the the culture of lesbians and queer women involving themselves in bdsm were the sex wars which is basically like here, here, here we are over here with the sex critical, we're the sex negative feminist, whatever label you want to use, and over here are like the the sex positive feminists, and they kind of just duked it out, and it kind of seems like from your conclusion that it was a war of attrition, where like eventually the cultural narrative took kind of more the side, let's say, of the the sex positive uh, feminist lesbians versus the like more sex critical sex negative side of things yeah that was a huge deal in in the early to mid 80s where uh radical feminists you know of the sort of andrea dworkin Catherine mckinnon camp were very strongly opposed to kink le kinky lesbians and wanted them basically you know kicked out of the the lesbian community and there was a lot of, you know, it was a war of words, it was a war. Um, so I think that, yeah, there's, there's, I think, yeah, like I said, the sex, that kind of feminism, unfortunately kind of lost, I, I'm, I'm not scratch the unfortunately, but that kind of feminism lost steam in the late eighties. And I think that it, it was sex positive feminism, um, third wave feminism kind of won and um, so there isn't quite that kind of anti-kink prejudice that you see uh, anymore. I mean, it's still there in some circles, but it's not a major force in the in the culture. Like nowadays, the biggest problems 
are uh, the biggest sort of threats to the kink culture and, and as a whole, I think come from other directions. A lot of it's very homophobic coming from the religious right. Some of it's actually not really about kink per se. Like there was a situation a few years ago when somebody smuggled in a camera into a Planned Parenthood office and got them to make it sound like they were advocating for 15 year olds to do kink. So that was, you know, that's the new threat, the new thing we have to worry about. I think things are definitely a lot better than they used to be about uh, legal persecution of kinky people and kinky media. Still obviously a lot of a long way to go. Yeah, but I, it's de there's definitely a long struggle to get there. And, and um, the, the struggle between um, radical feminists and sex positive feminists was definitely a big story in that. And I know we're, we're kind of coming up a little bit close on time here. So I wanted to also ask you, was there anything that you researched that you weren't able to put in the book or that you wanted to put in, but I had to cut for other reasons, like any sort of little interesting historical tidbits that you might have found out? Well, I wanted to write more about uh, the 1930s, sort of the pre-war era, and I had a lot of material there that I, I just couldn't sort of really fit into one coherent narrative. So there was, I was writing, I had like, uh, you know, uh, American films in the 30s, uh, and there was a lot of, especially the pre-Hays Code era, and you could see a lot of kinky stuff in there, like, especially like in the the, the Mask of Fu Manchu and other you know, sort of damsel in distress type scenarios. But uh, there was also like guys like uh, Man Ray, the photographer, and uh, he hooked up with a guy called, a very weird guy named um, William Seabrook, who collected, who, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, commissioned Man Ray to take photographs of sadomasochistic costumes and scenarios. And he was also an occultist. Later on, he and some friends, Seabrook and some friends, tried to cast a spell on Adolf Hitler. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they they were uh, Seabrook. So th there was a lot of material I wanted to explore, uh, but it didn't really fit together. And I'm hoping to work it into another book. I'm working on a new book right now called The Celluloid Dungeon, which is uh, about uh, kink in uh, television, films, and video games. Oh, interesting. And so that's why I wanted to explore um, some really interesting stuff I've actually found since the, the book was published about like early silent, uh, French silent adventure serials. Um, and there was a uh, kind of like the world's first cinematic female superhero known as Protea, who wore a black bodysuit. And uh, later on, the, the uh, the Le Vampire serial, which featured a, a seductive woman who also wore a black bodysuit. So this was like the prototype of the the woman in skin tight black. And also looking at like uh, the the Chic, uh, the Ruta Valentino movie, and and the you know how many women were swooning over the this domineering man from the Orient and things like that. So that's something I want to explore a bit more, but also look up to like. You know, I'm also looking at like uh, the Hellraiser uh, horror movies, and I just did a did an exploration of uh, the film Cruising, which was in 1980, and actually featured uh, real Leathermen from from recruited from the clubs in Manhattan at the time, uh, just before HIV hit. I think didn't James Franco just do a documentary that was like about that movie. I've seen it, but I, I like, I, I didn't watch all of it. Supposedly there was like 40 minutes of cruising cut from the film. And, uh, and Franco, I think was trying to recreate this, um, what it would have looked like, which is, I mean, there are a lot of stories attached to cruising, some, not all of which agree with each other. So, I mean, the story of the making of cruising is, is at least as interesting as cruising itself, but it does show that, that, you know, how, how people have looked at kink over the years has changed. And like you were talking in, in the last time about like secretary and how, you know, kink is, you know, kink has been made accepted as okay by the mainstream as long as it's like a very narrow definition that's compatible with conventional heterosexual romance. Yeah. I'm trying to explore that, you know, the look at other films like preaching to the perverted or that God awful, adaptation of uh, Exit to Eden in 1994.
Well, I know I, I've recently gone through like trying to put together a BDSM movie list of, of things that are, you know, you can actually still find online at least. And there's a lot of, especially in the 90s, like it seemed like there was this pre 9-11, like Bill Clinton era timeline where like there was a bunch of kink that showed up in movies. Yeah. Like you had nine and a half weeks and you had like eyes wide shut and like all of these movies that happen uh, that are super yeah. super like there's kink elements in them and then like after the 2000s it's like it basically drops off until you get 50 shades of gray and i found that to be really interesting yeah. because i don't know why i think there's a yeah there's an interesting point there i think yeah that that people became less interested in sexual exploration or at least hollywood became less interested in sexual exploration after in the, the, in the of the zeros that decade. So that's an interesting question to explore there. You know, might have also had something to do with the availability of hardcore through streaming services. And that meant like sexual, sexual imagery was sort of less a draw in the, in the movie theaters. Oh yeah, that's probably true. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. I can see why that would be the case because like being able to stream music and, and stream videos of every kind that you wanted from your own home like that really fundamentally changed a lot of well hasn't yet i think caught up completely with a lot of actual media producers but it it, it changed how why people went to movies and and what movies they wanted to see for sure i mean that is a, a bit of a shame because i also think that there are movies that are really in that that can explore sexuality different alternative sexualities in a very interesting way but if they're kind of few and far between and you have to hunt them down, they're not, pardon me, they're not huge. They're not big, you know, they're not movies like, you know, this movie is going to show you something you've never seen before. That was sort of the draw of nine and a half weeks or something like that. I don't think that's just not, a, I think that's just not a draw the way it used to be because you can get like, you know, Pornhub on your laptop anytime you want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So was there anything else you wanted to share with us or, or talk about today before we wrap up? The cover, I mean, there's a lot, but I'm, I'm glad we had this opportunity to talk and I'm glad to, to see people uh, getting interested in my book and talking about it. So I'm hoping um, my project for this year is the Celluloid Dungeon. So hopefully that'll be out in the I'm working on that this year, hoping to get a finished draft by the end of the year. So I'm hoping that this will open a new, sort of a new field of scholarship and people will explore more in the future. You know, it's it's on Amazon, it's on it's on the Nook, it's on Kobo, it's on Barnes & Noble. Hopefully it's in your local bookstore. I'll, hopefully they did not put it in the sexuality section, they put it in the history section instead. Uh, which is a problem I've had. And uh, I'm still blogging at uh, historyofbdsm.com and on Twitter at historyofbdsm. So uh, I hope that if anybody has any questions, you can find me there and I'm, hopefully I can help you out. Great. Yeah. Again, thank you so much for being here today and for sharing your wisdom and your research. I know. <laughs> I, I, I have information. I don't know if I have wisdom. Wisdom. Yeah. So, well, at the very least, thank you for sharing your information. And, you know, if anything else, I hope I, I know that there are people that I've spoken with that are going through their undergraduate, their master's degrees programs and and BDSM is an area of interest. And it's it's very intersectional. If you are talking about the history of fashion or philosophy or literature, there's, you know, tons of ways I think you could potentially approach this area. And I know you covered a lot of those in your book. So if people do have questions. Uh, or just want to find out more links to everything will be down in the description of this video so be sure to check those out if you want to reach out or, or get a copy of this book for yourself and uh and you can also leave comments down below as well if you want to leave something there and i will talk to you all again very soon have a great day bye, bye.